Hello, this is Alexei Smolyansk. I'm sitting with my daughter, and I thought that we might have a conversation about how we both got started in Dungeons and & Dragons, and uh, just talk about changes that we've seen. My daughter is 27. I am 51 years old. This is my daughter here. Hi. And she, uh, she and I have a very different ways of getting into the game. My first game, of course, was, well, I got started in Men and Magic in 1979, and she got started with... I got started with second edition D&D, not including some dabbling with my father, in 1998. That would make me 10 years old. Yeah, uh, she never played in my original game, because I, I had always felt that in in spite of the fact that D and D was was a great game, and of course I love it, I always felt it was something that that a person needed to come to at a latter age so that they would be able to understand the themes and the approaches. I know that many people begin their their children at five and six playing the game, making a very simple, very light-hearted, very easy, child-friendly game for them so that they can they can enjoy a little fantasy. I never wanted that because I felt that that would that would initially put in the wrong headspace into a child's into into my daughter's head so that so that uh, she would never be able to really look at the game as an adult would look at the game. That's probably for the best, given that I think the first module I ever played, we probably slaughtered as many orcs, describing eviscerating them with great joy, eat loudly through my school. <laughs> well, did you feel left out because I didn't? let you play the game. I mean, we had people that were coming over every Friday night to play. Uh, I later let my dad in on the fact that I was sneaking and watching his games. And to give you a kind of perception, given on the way he speaks, he was worse when he was younger, and he was more complicating, and he was not so good at uh, at breaking things down to his players. So my perception was, wow, that looks hard. <laughs> And I just sort of viewed it like great TV. <laughs> well, I, I've often tried to explain that as a DM, I wasn't anywhere near as good at that time. That there were so many things that I waffled and wallowed through that I simply, I, I never feel like I had some special talent for being able to manage people. It's just something I picked up with lots of experience. Well, and the perception of young people is that adults do adult things. And although the internet has changed that pre-internet popularity, you really viewed that the adult sitting around a table was an adult thing. You didn't view it as something you did now. It was something, cool, I'll do that when I'm an adult. Well, I'm really glad that you learned with other kids. I mean, I'm really glad that when you started playing, it wasn't with a bunch of adults who were, you know, letting you be the kid at the table and have a character. It was with people your own age. I think that that was a, that's a much stronger way to begin the game. This is how I began the game. Well, it changes the stress level when you do that sort of thing. Just that way, if you make an embarrassment of yourself or you make a judgment call because when you're eight, you don't understand how ballistics work, the people around you also don't know how ballistics work. So you kind of all bullshit. Yeah, that's totally how a bow and arrow works. You point it at stuff and it shoots. Yeah, absolutely. This does not work with adults. Well, you just I, feel embarrassed. I think it also has to do with when you're a kid and you're experimenting with things, you, your guard is down when the adults are around. We, we were able, I mean, you were talking just a moment ago about slaughtering orcs, and when you're eight years old and you use phrases like that, then it, it scares all the adults away. I don't think it would have bothered me very much, but anybody else that I would have played with, it would have sounded weird, it would have, it would have, it would have affected them, it would have affected the way that they played. They wouldn't have felt uh, free enough to actually talk their normal talk during the game. And it's kind of interesting that you were up the hall and around the corner and, uh, you know, occasionally poking your head out without any of us seeing you and getting an idea of how the adults played without actually, you know, exposing yourself so so that we you did hear what we were like when we were talking like real players. I, I remember when I was, I was a child, and of course my parents never played D&D, but they, they played poker. And they had parties that were at their house. They played poker and they played bridge. And I can remember being at the top of the stairs when they were playing. 
and how it sounded to hear adults shouting about winning pots or shouting about playing uh, spades or a grand slam and so on. I can remember those. I have those same memories just to a different game. I, for me, there are some things that have really changed. And mostly I argue it's the internet. And not, not that I have a problem with that. Uh, my first experience looking for D&D related stuff, and this to me is both tragic and sad. Uh, when I started playing second edition, to my knowledge, third edition already existed. But it was still quite new and it was very expensive and it was completely unrealistic for a bunch of, uh, by that point, point I was 11, uh, for any 11 year old to buy um, the newest books. So second edition was very easy to slip into. And we spent a lot of time trying to find answers on the internet, starting with how can I DM, what's a good idea, because although there were still tournaments around out of popularity, it was gone. There wasn't a lot of, of information. And I think I spent about maybe a week solidly scouring the internet for help from WOTC to anybody and, and literally finding nothing because blogs had not taken on any kind of functionality in that sense. Well, what do you think that third edition was attempting? I mean, I never played second edition, so what did you think third edition was attempting to solve? Um, the major difference, and I have to go back to AD&D, is that I feel that second edition was definitely more character driven because people had trouble making storylines. I had trouble making storylines. I can remember others having that issue. And we, second edition was so much easier because you could create a character and go, yes, I'm, I'm the great helmet and this is everything I do that makes me so neat. So you were affecting your environment much more than your environment was affecting you. And I think people embrace that really wholeheartedly. And third edition went psychotic with it. I've now played third and 3.5 and all the middling steps as well. And it is 100%. This is my character. This is how he affects his environment. So the environment doesn't have to be as creative. I can easily drop you in the middle of a field and just by your very existence, the way you've been designed, story arises. Well, I, I know enough about the three and 3.5 and so on. I know enough about them that people say that the combat is so lengthy and so detailed and so nitpicky that you're, you're saying that those things are because it was intended to give more control to the players, but it went over the top. It just went crazy. And that was proved even more when we went to fourth edition where we completely annihilated the purpose of combat and challenged it to such a degree that now it was challenging to create combat, to play combat, and even to get into proper combat. Well, I play a tactical game now, as you know, but back in 79 and 1980, when I first started, nobody played any kind of a tactical game. We didn't even play with miniatures on a table. If you had miniatures, they didn't really become popular, at least where I was, until maybe 1981 and 1982. And at first, their popularity was limited almost exclusively to this is my character I'm gonna put it next to my character sheet because it's just cool to have a visual addition to my character I mean this is a time when television was was everything in the world and we had no other real social media so things like just having a visual representation of your character sitting next to your character sheet was a big deal but when we played combat it was pretty much you're standing in front of of him and you're standing in front of the other guy and you swing and you swing. All right, and now the other two guys swing. Okay, and now you two guys swing. And now the other two guys swing. All right, you hit, he, he goes down. And now the one guy is left, he tries to swing and then you two swing and oh, it's over. We, we played the same way. You couldn't realistically, I mean, I did finally meet someone who was just the right quality of neurotic in my youth to make maps, but we didn't even pretend. Maps were boring, they were hard to make, they weren't well made when we tried. So we did a lot of that kind of turn-based visualization, which fundamentally I think made us better players. It forced to add to the game a need I remember, to role play. I remember it creating a lot of confusion. I mean, if you played with against more than three opponents, or if you played in a in a combat where where there were four or five or seven 
players at the table who are all fighting somebody and fighting more than, than seven exact opponents one-on-one, -on -one, it got real complicated trying to explain, okay, uh, he's too far away, you can't get to him to fight him, uh, no, you can't attack him because he's, he's moved. It, it just, visually, the only thing it seemed to set up for was one-on-one -on -one combats. And I remember drawing little X's and O's on paper for characters so that they could see, like, football schemes, you know. Here's here's your play, and you guys are all going to go left, you know, for an end run. And, and, so, and it started to make more sense to start to be tactical because nobody really cared what the combat was doing. Oh, my tragedy is everything was a stadium room. If the man is on a ledge, only the arrow men can shoot him. If he's on the higher ledge, no one can see him. If he's on the ground, you can attack him. So everything felt like a stadium. This is third edition. This was second. This was second. But just because of the limitations of being young. Because everything has to be simpler. Yeah. Just it had to be so simple. And that quickly destroyed. I had a DM for only maybe eight months, and it was clear. It was just beyond him. Between the math and the explanations, it completely slaughtered him. He tried so hard. But he was a kid, and he gave up, and he threw his hands into the air, and we didn't play again for another year. Well, there's certainly too little attention paid to the fact that people do do find themselves overwhelmed and, and that they do find themselves pushed to give up, particularly if the players, the friends that they have, aren't particularly supportive. We, we were so young. If I thought back to it now, the fact that he was handling six of us to a fairly extreme level, he was quite, he was quite good. He was quite good at making notes. That was crazy for a 10-year-old and good for him, but he definitely <laughs> left crying and like the supportive friends we were, we mocked him horribly for being a quitter for probably about three months until we decided to let that go. So the, you know, childhood evil never ceases. <laughs> okay, so kids that you're playing with, they mock this guy horribly as he's walking out the door. How does that make any of them feel like they could then step into the role of DM since they've already seen the, what the consequence is for failing? Oh, absolutely no one wanted to step up to the bat. I was actually browbeat into the role the following year because my practical hobby was to write, and that made me the elective official for this sort of stupidity. Okay, well, you weren't really telling me about any of this at the time. I remember that you told me about you running d d something like two or three years after you were actually doing it. So why did you keep it from me? Um, I think because you were not taking it to the level of seriousness, much like I stated with the previous thing. You watched your parents play, it was an adult game, and I think this is like children playing poker to go back for you, is that you feel you're doing such a crappy job, or you feel you're doing such a lackluster or not realistic job, that you don't really feel you're playing. You feel like you're dabbling with some vigor, but you're not playing. And if I look back, I still wouldn't consider what we were doing playing because you were too busy sort of getting a grasp of the rules. Okay, so I was intimidating simply because I was an adult. Simply, absolutely. And and these kids, just because of our age, all of their parents played. I don't think I had a friend in that group that didn't have a parent who played and wasn't supportive. We didn't have any parents that were like, no, 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 you guys can't play. But we all had parents that were very similar to yourself that were like, yeah, I'd love to let you play, but given how much math the treasure tables cost, this isn't going to be for you just yet. So none of them brought their children into the games when they were young? Absolutely no one. And this later became a major misconception when I got older that adults, when they became embarrassed that they played, when they stopped admitting to people, yes, of course I played in my youth. Then people were like, oh, you didn't have your children play because it was a terrible game and so on and so forth. But that wasn't the perception of my youth. My youth, when, when people started talking about their parents played d and I certainly told people when I was five, I was surrounded with other kids whose parents played d and and nobody thought it was weird. Just at five, you're much more interested in pretending to be a magician than you are at playing d d Well, there are definitely people who are doing it now. I mean, people write on their blogs, I taught my child this, or my child did this, or, you know, I'm, I'm, my child is playing a magic user, and so on. So it, it is around. Uh, just for context, when were you eight? I know, but when were you eight? What year was that? 1996. Okay, so this is pre, not very long after third edition came out that you were eight years old. So, so if third edition is out, why second edition? Who got you started? Our lead guy, Peter, 
uh, Peter's dad was a book collector and he made a particular hobby out of it. And Peter's basement not only had every second edition book you could have, but every available module. Uh, the only rule that Peter's father had was that Peter could copy from the books or could copy from the modules, but was not allowed to take them out of the house. So as I stated before, he took fantastic notes <laughs> given his youth, but it was a plethora of opportunity. Okay, well, I want to go back to why I never got into second edition. It wasn't, in fact, because I saw it come out and thought, oh, I'm too good for this. I didn't even know that it had come out until it was out for almost two years. There was no internet at the time. And so I was, uh, at the time, 88, 89, thereabouts, I had completely divorced myself from the social aspect. Uh, there were a series of conventions that I went to starting um, from 84, and I, know, I knew some of the people who organized those conventions because I had started the game when... In this city, you could you could almost count the number of people who could play on your hands and your toes, and it was the the game originally appeared in a small game shop where there were hardly any people who even knew about the game. Uh, the game shop sold a lot of other things, and the guy who ran the game shop was very talkative and very interested in letting more people know about the game. So we got interested in it mostly because of him. He's still around. He's running a, a well, he owns a shop called Sentry Box, which is here in Calgary, and he still owns that. But um, I got involved in, in these conventions, and I didn't like the scene in the conventions at all. They had a lot to do with the same complaints that I'm still having with people online, that the games weren't very serious, that nobody really cared what was going on, that characters were unimportant. I remember that I was brought in by my friends to come and DM because they, they liked my DMing. They thought I was a good DM and I should come in and help DM some of these games. I should play test games. I should help organize games. I should run tournament games. And I just, I did this as favors to people, but I just hated tournament games. 9, 10, 15 tables, all playing the exact same adventure, expecting that some people were going to do better than other people. And it just, it seemed like a completely mechanical, industrial, cheesy way to limit D&D &D to this tiny little framework. Like as though we were trying to make D&D &D a sport. And it just sickened me. And I got out of all of this. Now, uh, all, after all of this, and, and a generation later, what were your first experiences with, with conventions? I have done exactly two conventions, both with negative results. I was asked to come in and do a module for AD&D because embarrassingly for the stupidest reason, they asked me to do it sight unseen for my DMing when I was 21 because I was under 25 and they thought, oh, isn't that so cute? You're under 25 and you know how to play AD&D. How retro. Needless to say, the attitude, <laughs> the entire convention was sort of like that. I ran a table. So, I'm sorry, when was this? Uh, 21, so that would make me... This was just six years ago. Six years ago. Yes. So pretty recent. Pretty recent. And I was only there, I went with my uh, now fiancé. He was in for a magic tournament and doing very well, and they just asked me on the spot. I started running a module and immediately was surrounded by people who were more interested in just talking to me about, well, why don't I just switch to 3.5? And to tell you the truth, I never ran anything. I had stuff prepared. It didn't take me long to throw together a couple. I think it was trolls, something small. And uh, I was all ready to go, I, whatever they brought at me. But because they were really more interested in grinding an ax of, you should really try 3.5, uh, I got pissed off and called it. I apologized to the, I think, four people that had shown up at my table and said, if you're still interested, I could get you in touch with somebody else at a later point. But I was just mad. I, I couldn't, I wasn't anybody's dancing monkey. I have never 
never enjoyed playing this game with strangers. I have met some strangers who turned out to be quite interesting and they would have been great players and it would have been nice to be around them for a longer time. I could see them coming into a campaign and I think we would have really built up some good rapport over several months of a campaign. But walking into a room and playing with a total stranger where everything is immediately confrontational because a, they don't know what kind of DM I am, and B, I don't know what kind of player they are, so we're going to waste at least an hour and a half of the four hours together just testing each other's waters, trying to find out whether or not we are even remotely compatible, and then boom, the session is over. Nothing has really been accomplished. Nobody gives a crap because nothing that happened tonight is going to matter tomorrow. It's like one-off sex with somebody. I think you really need to be around people longer so that they can accept you as a person, understand a greater sense of what you're trying to accomplish, and see a depth world. This game is way, way too deep to get across in four hours. There are just too many changes in the way a person thinks or acts at the gaming table to be able to convey that properly in a four hour period. You could have to get to know people in order to know how to deliver a game to them that's really going to rock their world. Well, the second tournament I did was very different. They had already arranged a sit down table and it was for second edition. And uh, once again, my fiance was playing in a different tournament in the same room and it was a drop in for second edition. And I thought, oh heck, I haven't played second in forever. I would love to play second. This was sad for both the DM and myself and one other fellow. Uh, we were playing with a guy named Roy, who was tremendous. He actually still lives in Calgary, and I know him quite well. He was 45 and loved second edition, myself, and a younger DM, probably maybe 16 at the time. He had prepared something. Roy, myself, and him we're really interested in getting into the game. We rolled up some really quick characters. The DM was very proficient and excellent, but the five or six other people we were playing with were completely not serious. As Alexia stated, it's so many issues with people not getting invested. They don't care. And I think if I remember correctly, it ended with Roy throwing up his hands and making some statements about he was too old for this crap. and. I laughed and then we all we all sort of walked away and continued to know each other for a while. But it wasn't positive. We we weren't loved when we left. Everyone throws up their hands in your world. Uh, <laughs> it's my nice words for saying flipped you off, whipped a cup at you, and punched somebody in the eye. It's just the way my brain filters all of those things. Okay, well there's there's an interesting thing. We were talking we're talking about kids. Do you think that kids fight? at the table more than adults. I, I can remember incidents, uh, certainly, when people that I played with did get violent at the table, throwing dice at one another and so on, but some of the nastiest, nastiest sessions I had for, for people being being just vicious to each other happened when I was in my mid-20s. Uh, I would say that I experienced most of the negativity in my youth, arguably. M uh, most of my D&D after me being 20 was with you. So I didn't get the same kind of level because you tend to rein in your games a bit differently. But I definitely remember anytime somebody fucked up something that was going to get us killed, he was ready for a pencil or an entire case or a dice box or something to come at him. Because the, the tension would completely break and it would be like, you fucked it up. What were you doing? You just had to roll a 10. You couldn't roll a 10 and people would lose it. People would lose it. The whole game would go up. I, I remember a fellow that, that, that was playing in my game and he, he was having a bad night. He, he wasn't rolling very well and he, he dropped the dice on something and, and it, I don't even remember what the combat was going on, but he suddenly went into this tirade against his dice. And perhaps because I was young, I'm not even sure I believe this anymore, but at the time I was telling him that you need to take responsibility for your roles. You need to, you know, this is, I don't care about the dice. I don't want to hear you going on and on against the dice. I mean, it's annoying to hear somebody screaming at their dice. So I was saying that you need to take responsibility at your of your roles. And he told me to fuck off. And I told him no. And he threw the dice at me. And I told him to get the fuck out of the house. And he wouldn't go. I always think that's weird when you tell somebody, get out, and they won't go. And it wound up with me dragging him all the way out to the back door and then throwing his stuff out after him. That happened when I was 19. So with adults, with people, I you know, I'm saying 20s in my 
with adults, it's more threatening. It's more, I'm going to go knife your car. Or I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to send information to somebody or I'm going to tell such and such about you. I love by today's generations, it would immediately be, I'm going to put naked pictures of you up on the internet. And there was none of that <laughs> at the time. There was you. You, you can't photobomb everyone you, you, you could, hate. You could not photobomb everyone you hate. You <laughs> actually had to go and knock on their doors or make phone calls. And you could only do that one at a time. You couldn't actually destroy a person's life. The most you could do was tell their girlfriend. And since my girlfriends were always playing with me and at the table, then there wasn't really much you were going to do. Because, you know, here's my fiancé. Here's my wife. Here's, you know, the person I'm... I'm living with. They're right here at the table. They're part of my game. I was going to ask you earlier, you were saying about being 21 or being younger than 21 and knowing AD and date, but you didn't go for the feminist thing. You didn't say, they said I was female. So, you know. You know, I, this is so. As long as I brought up girlfriends. This is so tragic. <laughs> I have to say, I feel bad and I promise I'm not doing this to shit on anyone, but all of this anti-girl stuff has never happened to me while gaming. Many things in my life, I've worked construction, I've experienced it. But, you know, my boyfriend is a major player in gaming. He has been for years. He's played in a lot of Magic tournaments. He's played in a lot of online tournaments. He's tried out for Halo Canada. He's, he's quite huge. And we've been to everything at one point or another. And the attitude of anyone I've ever met is, you're a girl and you like games? Cool. And then they immediately, immediately, you have 800 friends because they want to see, they want to see what you think of their game. Have you tried this? Oh, play, play this. I've never had negativity for being a girl at a table. And I've never, I've never been treated like a novelty for being a girl at a table. They may be a novelty because they want to see what I think. But when playing games with them, they will attack or kill you or whatever they need to do at the same level. There's no sensitivity training. I clearly remember those those conventions in the 80s. I mean, this is 30 years ago now. So I clearly remember these conventions. They were held at a major hotel that, were down, that was downtown. And the hotel's rooms would fill up with people because they were <laughs> going to be there at the game for three days. And they would save up and they would buy into the hotel. So... Everybody who was there, hardcore, were living in the building where the convention was happening. And if there was a girl that showed up at the conventions, nobody was trying to push her out the door. There would be this, I mean, any girl who wanted to be a gamer in 1985 or 1986 was going to immediately have 50 or 60 little nerd slaves who would do absolutely anything that she said. And every one of those girls who would come to the campaigns, when you, you recognize the difference between the ones who were real gamers and the ones who were there because, well, you know, I'm going to get laid tonight. I'm going to pick my boy from this pile of boys who are going well, to congregate. Is a, there is a distinct amount of pet hunting, hunting from time to time. Yeah, pet this, hunting, sorry. This happens with cosplay. Yes, oh, hugely. And people don't talk about it. I wouldn't say people don't talk about it. I would say people that people say it loudly it. and nobody else does. <laughs> yeah, exactly. People outside of it don't talk about it. Girl shows up, she's in an incredible outfit. Instead of uh, all we ever hear about is she's bitching because people are making sexist comments and we're completely ignoring, as you say, the pet hunting. <laughs> yeah. What's pet hunting? Oh, pet hunting, which I'm glad to say I haven't done it because it seems like a lot of excessive work, is you're looking for somebody very specifically. I'll have to give a character, let's say Rogue from X-Men. So you already like X-Men, and you want somebody to have enough conversation with for, say, the weekend of the convention. So you dress in your sluttiest Rogue costume, find someone who wants to live out the fantasy of having sex with Rogue that doesn't irritate the shit out of you, and then you drag them back to your room, car, bathroom... <laughs> I've seen it all. Like, I I swear I've seen it all. <laughs> and the measure of how much you understand the rogue character is important. Absolutely. Because these guys or girls, I've seen it both ways, are trying to live out. It's sex play. It's a fantasy. You want to have sex with rogue. And you want the person to be 
the neurotic, psychotic, I can be this for you. If they only know what Rogue's costume looks like, kind of ruins the, the fantasy. So it, it shatters it. So, so I'm a 19-year-old boy, and I'm something of a nerd. And when I was 19, I was definitely a nerd. So I'm something of a nerd. I'm, I'm not the greatest social climber in my universe, and I'm, you know, I, I'm not looking great. So... While I'm working on my costume, that that will, what what is who does Rogue want to sleep with? Oh, it's Gambit. Okay, so Rogue wants to sleep with Gambit, and I want to work my ass off to make my best Gambit costume because this is my snare. And then I am spending weeks studying every single thing and memorizing every single thing there is to know about Rogue, in the hopes that when she asks me a question or I know what the key words to say that will get inside her heart. I'm I'm just I'm just there like plumbing away. Is that is that right? It's definitely for that context. I think I should go back and make the point that not all cosplay is this. I have <laughs> cosplayed as Calvin and Hobbes. So let's start with I'm not normally out there looking for that sort of thing. So the perfect girl <laughs> Calvin is looking for the perfect girl Hobbes to take out to her car so that they can sleep. Yeah, our, well, <laughs> that's, that's slightly unrealistic. It's got to be there. Okay, Rule 34, it has to be there. What What's the equivalent in d and I mean, do girls ever... Because I can't remember that. You said you've never experienced it. I have definitely stood up for girls at tables, at D&D tables, as early as the 80s, where where there was there was a certain amount of innuendo and attacking of the girl. And I, I particularly remember this at university because, for some reason, the difference between moving to high school to university really changed the dynamic of people who started to play at the clubs. In, in high school, we were playing at the cafeteria because it was okay. Nobody really knew what we were doing down there. We had a gymnasium-sized cafeteria at my high school. There were 2,000 people in my high school. And we were allowed to go down there to study until about 6 o'clock at night. So the fact that we were all gathering together to play four or five tables of D&D and Panzer Blitz and Squad Leader and whatever other war games were popular at the time, the management, I shouldn't say management, the, the office, the head office, I'm so far out of school, I've forgotten to call it the head office, didn't really know what we were doing down there. But by the time we got into university, it was, it was all advertising in the university newspaper and so on, and it became really quite confrontational. I won't say that I hadn't seen stuff before. I haven't personally experienced it, but I have met others who have. Uh, two of the women who play in our game currently experienced it a lot throughout the years which blatantly stopped them from gaming for quite some time just because they are lesbians they have been for as long as i've known them probably the last 11 years and the fact that they were lesbians and the men would joke and write about that or they would ride them about the fact that they had no business being there or that this was a guy's game so on and so forth i mean it's not that it isn't there but the fact that it's the reason why girls don't play or anything like that is completely unknown to me. I tend to think it's crap. I have played with more jerks in my life than I would care to say. And the truth is, is that you're always going to play with jerks, whether you're a girl or a boy. I used to play with a redheaded guy and he quit playing because he was sick of the ginger jokes. Okay, well, let's talk about jerks for a while because certainly my early experience with the game was surrounded my, my first my first confrontational problems with getting to know this game and liking this game and being part of this game surrounded certain jerks that I played with or had to play with if I wanted to play the game it, it was always there that if you wanted to get into a campaign with Middle Earth or Earth or Empire of the Petal Throne or a role master campaign I remember very clearly uh, there was a certain reality that you had to face that you were going to play with this great DM, and he was he was an amazing DM. But there were two people at the table who were absolute assholes that the DM was tolerating because they were all friends, and you didn't know these assholes. So if you wanted to play, you had to suck it down at a certain level and accept that you were going to play with assholes. And I, I never liked that. I was never happy about it. But it was something which, for a time, I accepted as normal. I don't know why that happens. I've talked on my blog endlessly about not letting it happen at the at the table, about being aware, but I think that 
I, I shouldn't say I don't know why that happens because it happens because people are friends. I don't know why people are friends with these people. I'm not friends with assholes, but I think that this has always been something that has been ignored or passed over or just as I used to do, taken as normal. You just accept it and you move, you, you just thank God I'm playing the game. And if I have to play with assholes, then I will. I, I didn't experience this just because I, I'm, I have the same temper you do. And by the time I was 12, I was running the game. I ran the game for a year, as I've stated on your blog. I ran the game for a year. I have a zero tolerance meter. I would just throw people out left, right, and center. I was always known for being being very purple. And for anybody who doesn't know being purple, it's that I'm, I have a really good way of describing things. I have a talent for painting a picture. And this is something I've always had and was much more prized when I was 12 than it is when you're 27. I just became intolerant. After the year, I stopped playing because of that. I'd had enough. I didn't care. I was asked time and time again to join games or play games because by that point, the waters were getting thinner. I went to a school with a lot of people who were first generation who had never even heard of this game and then, of course, came to my school and were sort of introduced. So the point being that they weren't, they weren't Canadians intrinsically. You grew up in a neighborhood that was very multi multicultural. I grew up in a neighborhood that was almost entirely white. There was hardly anybody in my school who wasn't white. I mean, the three black people in my school were noticed. It was obvious that they were there. I grew up with no real prejudice at all, possibly because I was Canadian. But it just happened that in the 1970s, the likelihood of somebody not being white and living in Alberta was incredibly low. But I, I would say 70% of my uh, junior high class between the ages of 12 and 14 uh, were English second language easily and they did quite well because of course they'd come here when they were young but the concept of DD was way left field they knew me well like my father I grew up with no prejudice so I when they would say oh come play my game with me you paint such a better image or English is so much better I would go and I would play for a little while or I would help them make worlds or images but eventually someone would tip me over or piss me off and I would leave I would say thanks sorry I can't help you I'm leaving goodbye I hated anyone I played with because I couldn't stand the crap I had no tolerance for it well, this is partly why eventually I stopped playing altogether. I could control the crap at my own table. I could keep everybody relatively happy. I could make sure there was no sexism, there was no fascism, there was no assholes. There were no, none of that happened at my table because I simply wouldn't tolerate it. So I could trust that the game that I was playing was going to be directed primarily at the game and not at people trying to use the game as a means to socially, I don't know, torture other people would be a way of putting it. Yeah, I think that's an accurate perception. Because I, I do think that many of those people who got into the game early on were nerds. They did have a limited social aspect and they were able to torture a young 15-year-old kid who was playing together with a bunch of 20-year-olds because we were easy targets, we were vulnerable, we weren't that socially adept ourselves. And yeah, it, it, it made it possible for them to, to feel more superior in an atmosphere where there were no almost no rules. I mean, there was nobody around. It wasn't like, you know, playing football where the coach was there to clear things up for anybody who didn't know how to play properly with others. It was a complete free-for-all. Oh, absolutely. It is a game of your own making. You have 100% control. And for some people who have no control in their life, the little bit of control it provides you as a player or the excessive control it provides you as a DM can become just monstrous quickly because you, you see that control. You can either push other players around as a player. I'm strongly charismatic and I develop a certain, I can command a certain amount of respect from people. And if I really wanted to, not that I feel any interest to, if I went and joined somebody's game, and immediately decided, I don't like the way Jim runs, and I'm going to convince all of Jim's players to tell Jim to go screw himself and take over Jim's game. You get the right group of people, you can do that without much trouble. And it's horrific. Well, my, my first experiences with playing games with people were playing hockey, uh, playing baseball, playing football. 
you know, the, these were team sports where you had to play with other people, where there was a coach that was on top of you, and there was no shit. I was a nerd. A lot of times I was the guy that sat on the bench. I had moments where I shone, and it enabled me to continue to be part of a team. But I more or less appreciated the fact that there was some sort of order and rule of control that existed. And when I moved into playing games like D&D, it was difficult for me to accept that nobody was going to collar these guys in or restrain these guys or make the the environment better. And I, I did chafe against that quite a bit. Anyway, I think this is a good place to stop. I mean, we could get into a lot of other subjects, but we have talked about making additional podcasts. Uh, there are other things that we can definitely talk about other than people we've played with or getting into the game. So I think we will call it here and uh, we will put try to put up another podcast in a month or so. If anybody wants to let us know some subjects that we might talk about, as you can tell, we're both very talkative, very vocal people. We have opinions. We don't always agree. After all, there is a generation gap between us. Let us know. Just drop us a line and we'll try to take something up. I'm thinking the next conversation we might have is something to do with world building. So anyway, you all take care and you'll hear from us again. Goodbye.